Hi everyone, how's it going? In this video, we're going to be discussing statistical models that are relevant for abnormal psychology. There are three in particular that we're going to be working on. And they are the mediator model, the moderator model, and lastly the stress diathesis model. The three of these are each ways of informing us about relationships between variables that are relevant to mental health and to help us understand big picture trends in terms of what typically happens for most people. So I'll go through the three of them in order, I'll give some examples, elaborate on some details of each, do a quick recap, and that'll be it for this video. So uh, the first here, a mediator model and a moderator model actually, they both share something in common which is that they start with a correlation between an independent variable and a dependent variable. And this could be all sorts of things, uh, that stress is related to disordered outcomes, that trauma is related to symptoms, that child sexual abuse is correlated to poorer outcomes later in life, right? So there's many, many different things in abnormal psychology where the research is clear that there are links but what mediators and moderators do is help us explain in more detail how and why those links take place and give us um, a better grasp on the mechanics of those relationships. So, a mediator, the thing to remember about this is that it represents an indirect pathway. Or in other words, there is some third variable that is a middle step in the relationship between the other two variables. So to graph it out with a picture, it would look something like this. Where we have some variable A that's related to an outcome variable C, but in the middle we've got this variable B that is an important intermediate or indirect step in that process. Um, so to give you an example, uh, a recent study found that there was a mediator in terms of people's work stress and how that was related to drinking problems. So specifically, they found that a loss of control at one's job is correlated to using drinking as a way to cope, which we know is, is symptomatic and an unhealthy way to respond to one's environment. So I'll, I'll write control here for A, drinking here for C, but specifically their study found that not everyone with uh, less control in the workplace was led to drinking behaviors. Um, specifically, wh what ended up happening was that uh, those who their lack of control at work led them to experience higher rates of job distress. They then used drinking as a coping mechanism. So I'll put job distress here. So what we're trying to say here is that becoming distressed about one's work was an intermediate step in the process of going from losing control in your job to drinking as a way of coping with your job. Um, and again, an important thing about any of these three models is that they are statistical models. They're, they're big picture ways to explain what happens. This is not like we're saying um, Sarah was demoted at work and so she had less autonomy. Um, she became distressed at work and then she went into the doctor and she diagnosed Sarah with um, alcohol dependence, right? That's an anecdote, that's a story about one person. With any of these statistical models, what we're talking about is data that's coming from hundreds or thousands of people, and the model is a way of showing the average outcome or the average way that the trend works. Okay, I'll give you another example of a mediator. I'll erase the variables that I wrote in here. Okay, in another study, they found that there was a link between people's faith and their happiness. Uh, 
Okay, so by faith I mean the strength of one's religiosity and spirituality. And by happiness I mean feeling satisfied with life, feeling content, right, feeling good. So they found that there was a correlation between those two, but the researchers asked, can we specify in a little more detail why that relationship happens? And their hypothesis was that service-mindedness might be a part of that story. So that was the mediator here. So, service. What they meant by that was people's willingness to engage in charity, people's philanthropic efforts, spending time volunteering, right, doing good things in the community. And their hypothesis was supported by the data. So what this means is people don't necessarily always live a happier life specifically because they are faithful, but being faithful increased people's likelihood to be service-minded, and then service-mindedness increased people's happiness, which is sort of interesting, right? You think volunteerism, going out and doing charity work, you're doing it for others, not yourself, but people ended up being happier because of engaging in those behaviors. So that was a mediator model that was supported by the data. And an interesting thing about mediator models is that sometimes the mediator variable is such a strong influence that this initial correlation ends up becoming not statistically significant after you account for this middle step. So again, to sum it up, a mediator is an intermediate or indirect pathway variable that contributes to a relationship between two other things. Okay, now let's talk about a moderator model. These are statistical variables that change the strength or direction of a relationship between two other variables. Or in other words, it somehow affects the relationship. That might sound similar, but hopefully this uh, picture will kind of help you keep them separate in your head. So in a moderator model, we're actually going to take uh, a line of influence straight down from the moderator to the link between the two, rather than to the variables themselves. So, an example of a moderator oftentimes is something about the person, so a, a quality of that individual. It could be things like age, race, sex, sexual orientation, ethnicity, um, other sorts of things that exist as qualitative parts of a person. Not all moderators have to be that way, but that's what many of them are in the literature. So to give you an example, um, there's plenty of evidence that shows exposure to repeated traumas is linked to post-traumatic symptoms, right? Hence the name PTSD. So that's sort of intuitive, right? Um, but the literature is pretty clear that the more times someone is exposed to a trauma, the more likely they are to experience post-trauma symptoms. Things like flashbacks, nightmares, intrusive memories, um, a heightened startle response and jumpiness, okay? Anxiety, more broadly. So over here I'll put trauma. And over here I'll put PTS for post-traumatic symptoms. Okay, what moderates that relationship? There's actually a number of interesting examples from the literature. And one is IQ. Specifically, folks with a higher IQ tend to be a bit less impacted by the frequency of traumas. So the correlation for high IQ folks tends to be a bit weaker than the correlation for lower IQ folks. Here's another one. Sex. The literature tends to show that in women, more exposure to traumas is a stronger correlation to post-trauma symptoms than it is in men. And there's some interesting explanations for that. It could have to do with the kinds of traumas that women experience, things like sexual assault and abuse, which tend to be a bit more personally intrusive than the traumas men tend to experience, which are more often violent or involved in military service or war experiences. So that could be part of it. But in the big picture, sex is a moderator for that link between trauma exposure and post-trauma symptoms. Okay, I'll give you one more, and this is a, a different topic here. There's a known correlation established by a lot of literature 
that significant life events, so changes, losses, setbacks of various kinds, the number of those significant life events is correlated to one's likelihood of having a depressive episode. So I'll put life events here. And depression over here. And there's an important variable that moderates that relationship, and that is one's genetics. Specifically, there's what's called the 5-HTTLPR, that's a bit of a mouthful, but the 5-HTTLPR gene has to do with the way that the brain processes serotonin, and sometimes referred to as the serotonin processor gene. Well, in the human genome, there are two different kinds of alleles on the 5-HTTLPR gene. You can either have a long allele or a short allele. And everybody has two of these 5-HTTLPR gene alleles. So you can be born with either the long-long combo, the long-short combo, or the short-short combo. So there's three different options of this variable. And the research shows that the correlation between number of difficult life events and depression is moderated by the phenotype that a person has on this gene. Specifically, those with the short-short allele combo are more vulnerable to depressive episodes after stressful life events. So it's a very clear moderator, right? In the short-short population, this correlation is stronger than it is in the long-long population. Okay. Um, if you're a little unsure, you're, you're reading an example about something and you're, you're having trouble figuring out whether it's a mediator or a moderator, one helpful thing to ask yourself is, could the A variable impact or change the B variable? In a mediator, it has to. In a moderator, that's impossible. Okay. So, uh, for instance, your faith can change the way that you view service. Your faith, your life events, all sorts of other psychological variables can't really change your genetics, right? Um, they can't change your sex, they can't change your race or ethnicity. So most of the time, this B variable is a permanent part of a person. So if you look at that A to B connection and you think to yourself, no, there's no way that those are connected, then if anything, you might be talking about a moderator model. If they do appear to be connected, you might be talking about a mediator model, okay? And then lastly, a specific type of moderator, which is really important to abnormal psychology because it contributes to our discussion of etiology, or in other words, the causes of mental disorders, is what's called the stress diathesis model down here at the bottom. The thing to remember about this is it's essentially a statistical model for combining nature and nurture in discussing etiology. Okay, so what do I mean by all that? There's a pretty obvious connection between one's level of stress and one's probability or percentage likelihood of developing a disorder. So if we want to put it up here on our moderator picture, uh, we could do this. Stress. likelihood of disorder, right? That's, that's correlated. The more stress people tend to experience, the more likely they are to develop a disorder of any kind. Right? That's not totally shocking, and there's plenty of literature to support that. But there's an important thing that moderates this, and that is what's called diathesis. Diathesis refers to one's inherited susceptibility for a disorder. In other words, we're talking about your genetic inheritance or very, very early life events that are a part of your life history the whole time that could put you at a greater risk for mental disorders. The stress diathesis model was originally designed to help address what causes schizophrenia, but was later applied to most other mental disorders and there's plenty of literature supporting this and helping us to understand where they come from. And so importantly, we find 
it's not just nature, or in other words, your genetics, your physiology, your body. And it's not just nurture. It's not just how you were raised. It's not just the way you were taught to think and the experiences you've had. But it's an interrelated combination of the two. So, this correlation between stress and likelihood of a disorder is moderated by one's diathesis. And it looks something like this, where folks with a higher diathesis, in other words, maybe schizophrenia runs in their family, are going to have a stronger correlation between stress and schizophrenic outcomes than our folks with a lower diathesis, for whom schizophrenia doesn't run in their family. So the chart might look something like this. So the idea being, as you move across this chart, we're moving from zero to 100% stress, right? And these are sort of abstract hypotheticals. But somebody with zero stress is probably not going to have a psychotic break and become schizophrenic. Probably not. But somebody with a 100% stress level, if you push anyone hard enough, they're going to break somehow. So it's possible that anybody could start to have psychotic symptoms of hallucinations, delusions, uh, delusions and disorganization of various kinds, right? But what happens in between those two extremes is really important. So folks with a higher diathesis for schizophrenia are going to reach, say, a 70% likelihood of developing the disorder much sooner than those with a lower diathesis. So again, diathesis has to do with things like the disorder running in your family, it being more susceptible in your genetics, or early life experiences like the death of a parent prior to age five, okay? Or, or being born um, addicted to a substance because of uh, what one's mother was using uh, prenatally, okay? So, to recap here, we've got three different statistical models that help us discuss abnormal psychology and help us specifically understand the mechanisms of these links between things and they're really helpful for discussing etiology in particular. We've got the mediator, which is an indirect pathway between two variables. We've got the moderator that affects the relationship, or in other words, it changes the strength or direction of a correlation between two variables. And then a specific type of moderator is the stress diathesis model, which is a big piece of how we talk about etiology, and that says Yes, stress is relevant because the more stress someone has, the more likely they are to become disordered. But what's also relevant is their diathesis or their genetic inheritance. And that diathesis moderates the relationship between stress and disordered outcomes. Okay, so those are three statistical models to know about. Thanks for watching. Have a great